the fascists are always dead. <laughs> I think the socialists did it too. They let people hop around. The Russians, even in the prison, they wake them up at 5 o'clock and they have to do gymnastics. I had to do that too in the German military. Ah, it was cool. Okay. Very good. So I just told... Is there something to... <coughs> oh, yes, this is I just told uh, Dustin and David, um, the sociology department asked us to have another course then in spring, next spring. And so I said we want to do it on Eric Fromm, social psychology. I don't even know if they have a social psychology part here. I think the guys left who did this. Hmm. But they should have it. It would be good to have it. So, uh, so <coughs> Eric Fromm today. Is social psychology today. And there's a lot of literature there. By this Funk guy there and others. So and they neglect him a little bit. You know, my daughter studied psychology here, she never heard of from. So Okay. Very good. We can have a movie again to our entertainment. Um this is this woman here whom we saw in the movie too, that's the secretary. There's a movie on her before she died. I think she died in the meantime. And then we can go with the Hitler thing, or we can go with the Nuremberg thing, or we can also, you know, do the more thing, capitalism, but you saw that probably already, right? You saw this. You are all enlightened people. Okay. Uh, was that a graduate class? It's another graduate okay. class, yeah, right, yeah. The same number, but you can take that number several times because it's a different theme all the time. You can use our book that's coming out this summer and from... Yeah, you can. We have a book there. That's right. And from Iran. Okay. Um, that one's from Holland. From Holland? Yeah, that one's in Rotterdam. Okay, but this guy sits in Iran, right? Yeah, but the editor's in Florida. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's all around. It's a global tradition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we come today to our... Uh, 13. 13, yeah. Then we have one more, right? <coughs> and then we are finished. Did you, put the, did you do the paper? Do you have the paper? Can you give me the paper? Just put it over here, and then I give it back to you next Wednesday, right? And then we are finished. Okay. It would be very sad to see you go. It'll make me weep. I'm already weeping. Okay, <laughs> uh, so that was the test back. Um... Then let's start out with the contemporary issues. Time diagnosis, right? Time prognosis are two very important uh, categories in the critical theory. It comes from Hegel originally. Hegel had this idea that when you look at the morning paper, you can see providence at work in the morning paper. So then you can analyze and then you see what providence is doing from day to day. Uh, that was Hegel. But that's where the words come from, the category comes from. And so the critical theory is continually in contact with, or is supposed to be, with that what is happening. So what is happening? Was there anything happening? Well, I have a few things here and I give them to you and then you can look at them. First thing is Thatcher died. That's really sad, sad. Who was Thatcher and what does it mean for time diagnosis in terms of the critical theory as we had it here in terms of Habermas and the whole background you know to Kant and Hegel and so on uh, for this whole stream of dialectical critical tradition um, what does Thatcher well, the name Thatcher mean um, and also the prognosis will something like that happen again <laughs> one gets grey hairs by uh, one doesn't have them already but just thinking of this possibility so Thatcher freed market forces and Europe is still adjusting. <laughs> so she is buried. I think today they will bury her. And first they wanted to bury her like Churchill and then they did a little bit less. Uh, I don't know. There were struggles about that, how she was to be buried. But so, so there is a figure, you know, a historical figure. And uh, how do we do this? You know, how can we approach this? Um, very simple. I mean, she was obviously what we call, she belonged to the tradition of liberalism. Uh, she rejected Keynesianism, Lord Keynes. We know what that is, Keynesianism. Right? Keynesianism 
is the attempt to rescue civil society or capitalist society or prevent the crisis by high government spending, by massive government spending, but not necessarily for for um, for armament or so, but for social issues. So uh, let's see for student loans, you know, this is, uh, we discussed that a lot, students is massive uh, debts and so on, <coughs> how can that be handled and and also welfare programs and uh, social security and medical things, so education and medicine and so on. So you spend a lot for that, and that means, of course, that employs a lot of people. Um, a lot of people become consumers and therefore will buy things, and therefore you prevent the accumulation of inventory, which is the core of a depression. So it is an antidepressive measure um, for for the for the economy. So. Now, um, this neoliberalism rejected that. Fascism, these are always this, the uh, bad trinity there, which we have liberalism, uh, socialism, and fascism. So, the, uh, um, the fascists, uh, Hitler was a Keynesian. Hitler had, and you can look at the movie there again here, um, didn't have a real, uh, you know, he was a self made man. He studied himself. He, left high school and didn't go to a gymnasium or to the university and so on. So when he came back from the war, he be, was employed by the army as a, uh, as a spy, you know, that's a bad name maybe. The army was afraid of uh, socialistic upheavals in Munich and so they hired him in order to visit those socialistic groups. Uh, in order to see if they are dangerous for the government and for the army and so on. That was his task. That is how he got to that little group, the National Socialists. There were only 12 people. <laughs> and then he made out of these 12 people, he made this unbelievable mass movement by his rhetoric. He suddenly discovered his voice and, uh, had, uh, and people you know, followed him. And, and then, of course, he made a putsch in, uh, in, Vienna, in Munich and uh, with Ludendorff, one of the generals beside Hindenburg, and they marched into the so-called Feldherrnhalle. It was a big monument for the people who had died in the First World War. And he was ca they were caught, by the, they were shot at by the, by the police, by the army, by the army, the very army, and uh, Hitler ran away and went into a taxi <laughs> and drove off. I think Ludendorff just marched on, <laughs> the old general, just marched on to that Thing, and I think nobody really died a dare to shoot at him. <laughs> he and Hindenburg were the people who won the Battle of Tannenberg. They drove 10,000 of Russians into the Manzurian <coughs> lakes, and they all drowned in there, which was a horrendous victory, which broke already the Russian back before it even started the whole thing. And then, of course, they uh, fought in the West, and they met, made the last Somm offensive together, which was rather successful. And they broke through the British and French lines and so on. And then something strange happened, maybe a weakness of the nerves or whatever. And Hindenburg and Ludendorff presented to the Emperor that the army was not any longer able to resist. And uh, that if he didn't want to have Austria of Germany or so, he should make could make peace. That is the parallel to when Hitler made this last attack in the uh, the Aden offensive, the last Aden offensive in the town. Was, I was only a few miles away from from his headquarters, and I watched his train and Goering's train there. So it happened right close by. And then afterwards, he was it was suggested he should now uh, should now uh, uh, you know give up the whole thing and. Uh, somehow make peace with the Allies. The same thing what Ludendorff in Hindenburg told the Emperor, and he remembered that, Hitler remembered that, and he threatened with his suicide and refused, and that was in January, 10th of January, and he drove back with his train, because I had to stop watching that train, because it left, and he went through, through Frankfurt and then to, to, uh, to Berlin in his bunker, everything burning in Berlin already, and so on. So it lasts another three months, March, April, end of April, so 10,000 people died with this. So there was a parallel between the two. So we, And we said already that, uh, that there was a von something in the Institute for Social Research who, whose father, also the 
second time I had to sign the German armistice in Reims and there was this little man here who called me up and I should ask him who was friends with, um, with the uh, car driver, driver, woman driver of Eisenhower with whom Eisenhower was in love and he said Eisenhower was never there in Reims and so on but the Dönitz had to sign and uh, the father of this uh, this critical theorist there he was also um, was there and had to sign and he told his family already he would commit suicide he said I cannot go through that the second time his first time and second. so these two wars were only 20 years apart you know and it was uh, it was the same objective really it was uh, a war among colonial powers and uh, and the only difference was that Hitler wanted to have the colonies now in Eastern Europe and not in Africa, and he thought he would come to get through with this, and he didn't get through with it in England. That did him in. That there were the two front wars and so on. So, so that is for the, for the German faith, you know, that was the doubling up of the whole thing. So, nevertheless, uh, <coughs> Hitler had a little studies in economics, um, and that well, he studied Marx too. So. Uh, as we said, the critical theory is an anti-fascist type of a theory, theory and praxis. And, uh, but fascism is also an anti-Marxist operation. So Hitler's my struggle, it was a life philosophy, a life philosophy which was directed against uh, Marxism, and Marxism was Judaism, and not only communists, but also social democrats. So, um, and so he, uh, so he knew a little bit of political economics, as far as he had read it in Marx, but then he also took a course with somebody who was an economist. Oh, and that economist, um, this main p object was to overcome credit slavery. You know, we have these credit cards everywhere. They had that too at that time. And so millions of Germans had, to, you know, the cards are used up. And so Hitler's entrance into the capitalistic economy was <coughs> credit slavery. And he emphasized that, and he made that teacher of his into a minister of economics. But some a few years later, two or three years later, the guy didn't function anymore, and Hitler fired him. Maybe, I don't know exactly what the reason was why he was fired, but... <laughs> so, uh, nevertheless, Hitler got into this, uh, into this Keynesianism, and, uh, of course, not alone, he had some good bankers and uh, some industrialists. Hitler was a low bourgeois guy, and the industrialist group in Thyssen and so on, they, that was the high bourgeoisie, and they had great contempt for him. Hitler, when he was running for, for the chef, he went to the Krupp household, he went to the Krupp family once, and they treated him very coldly. One year later, he was chancellor, and they all fell on their knees before him. And so, and so somehow he got him on his side. Um, there was the occasion where the uh, where the club, the Heaven Club, the Master Club in Düsseldorf, um, tried to find uh, the uh, some other people, the brothers there, who were more to the left of the National Socialist Party, wanted to talk with them. The Strauss? No, the brothers. No, it was not Strauss, it was the brothers, whatever. And uh, one of them was shot in, in Munich, and the other brother went to Canada. <laughs> so they were somehow the um, component, uh, you know, opponents in the fascist party. It wasn't firms either. No. Um, so they want to nationalize and all this. And so, but they met Hitler in Berlin on the street. And Hitler said, well, it's better I come than those. <laughs> so, he went there and made a deal with them and said they would be would not be touched their poverty and so on and so and then he found their support so but uh, and for 1933 up to the fall he still put some on trial like Putin does today when he put the oligarchs on trial and so on and then he changed it and he said you know history will judge us according to how many people we, we will employ not how many capitalists we put into prison and so on so and then come, came this unbelievable miracle in 1934 where he gave 6 million people uh, jobs and not yet arming it was not yet armament thing but it was simply by <coughs> this unbelievable high spending for social issues uh, the German workers didn't have to pay taxes at all so slowly when the war came then the other the populations out there had to pay for the taxes which he didn't pay but so he gave uh, supported schools and medicine and, and all these things, and that m made this uh, made this possible. Um, of course, part of it was also the transfer.
transfer agreement, uh, the Americans here in the East Coast blocked his commodities, the German commodities, uh, the Jews did it. The same Jews who blocked Henry Ford so that he couldn't sell his tea model anymore. And they broke his neck there, the guy. He, uh, he pulled back the, um, the uh, St. Paul of oh. the Elders of Zion, which he had printed, and his book, which is over there, the four volumes of the International Jew. He had to pull it back from the market and then they gave in, as far as Ford was concerned. But they blocked the German commodities, the cars, Volkswagen, and so on. And so Hitler made a transfer agreement with the Jews, with the Zionists. And uh, the Zionists then got the following thing. He would pay $25,000 for every Jew who would go to Palestine. So at that time there was no state, there was just Jewish Palestine, or Arab Palestine. And so he... Uh, uh, paid that, and Erna down there, a friend of mine, she's here in town, she was one of those who got the $25,000. And the poor woman, she was engaged. And her uh, fiancé went first, he got the 25000 Then she got it. In the meantime, she was raped by Hitler Youth leaders in Berlin. A horrible thing, tragedy, which, which she cared for the rest of her life. When she came to Palestine, her fiancé had married somebody else. So poor Anna had no fiancé anymore. So she just married somebody. And it was a horrible marriage, but it lasted 55 years, 55 years. So that a marriage lasts long doesn't mean that it's happy. So finally they got divorced and he married an Aryan then here. And poor Anna never married anybody. So, uh, so these little singular, singular tragedies, you know, they are very, very important ones has to be careful, you know, for the sociologist, mark your sociology or whatever, system uh, things that one doesn't forget, you know, that there are little people involved everywhere, out of the blood and with their faith and so on. So that was the transfer agreement and so the American market opened up and that contributed, of course, to, to that tremendous success which Hitler had. And there were some problems with Keynesianism which Hitler solved. In a certain sense, he was ahead of Keynes. Uh, in the application of Cain, Cain, Keynesianism. <coughs> and so then after the Second World War, that Keynesian came up again. But then came that counter-movement, the neoliberals, uh, which we had. Romney was the last one there. We wanted to do the same thing again, what Reagan had done, which led to the catastrophe. And <coughs> thanks <coughs> to God, the American people were smart enough not to fall into it a second time. So, <coughs> But... Um, the neoliberalism is the old liberalism of the 19th century, but uh, it is the, the belief that this crisis of 1929, 1939, out of which Hitler came and all this, uh, that this was just an accident and it wouldn't be repeated anymore. Um, so therefore, uh, capitalism was saved now. And therefore, one could now release these forces of production, as the Marxists would say, and uh, deregulate de de and privatize and so on. And uh, so, um, and the hope was that, that when the rich would get richer, then the poor would also get a little bit richer. The trickle down uh, thing. So, when you allow the rich, you know, to follow their <laughs> their greed in terms of the, what Hegel called the cunning of reason, they all want to be greedy and just want to fill their stomachs and so on. But on the side, they are doing something too. So it's like giving cows green meadows to feed, and then you m get milk from them. So you use them in a certain sense. So, um, by the way, my son uh, works for a fact for a corporation which produces air, oxygen, and so for hospitals. And of course, they are only just for the bottom line. He is he's some kind of a guy who has to count and calculate their profit where they can make the greatest profit. Not that it makes my son happy. He really wanted to rescue frogs, but you couldn't make any money with rescuing <laughs> frogs. So he uh, rather went to, to economics to get rich. And so and so he was just t two weeks in uh, in China, and he will go with me to Europe now, too. Uh, but so they go there to China in order to get uh, good profit, of course. And the socialist governments, like Stalin did in the 20s, they allow them to make profits. Kazan is was this park where the 140 capitalists live in in North Korea. They built about 140 uh, factories, and they made a lot of profit. The workers work for long hours and very disciplined, but then they are supposed
supported by the socialist government. They get free education, free health insurance, etc. Et so they can live with a relatively low wage. So that means the capitalists pay them a very low wage. The government gives them anything, everything free, and so they make a deal. And but what these capitalists, the capitalists only want to have their profit. But what they do at the same time, they build these factories where you produce airs. They show him the know-how. Uh, they train Chinese CEOs and so on. So that means they support the class enemy. That is exactly what Hale called the cunning of reason. That means uh, people just follow the selfish things, but as they do that, they do something else than their selfish things, which they would not even think of or they forget about it or just are blinded for it. So. And uh, and that, you know masses of capitalists are doing that. They they, they make a contract with the, with the devil for uh, the, this having this profit. But as they do that, they strengthen those who will undo them. That means by following their profit, they undo themselves. So <laughs> it takes a little time and you know and long run. So <laughs> nevertheless, here we are back to neoliberalism, and um, Thatcher was the British relative of this. She was very tough. She was called the Iron Lady, and um, she contributed also to the neoliberal counter-revolution, um, where Reagan spent those trillions of dollars for armament. But besides that threat of armament, there was also the World Bank in Paris, and many of these socialist governments took up money. <coughs> the reason was, and I observed that with Tito, um, the issue was these people had now fought for against capitalism and against fascism. And they had driven Hitler out of Eastern Europe and uh, Stalingrad and so on. They won that. Now, what you have to do then is to have primitive capital accumulation. That means everything was destroyed. All what they had accumulated by their work before was gone, burned up and so on. Now, there was a new primitive capital accumulation. That means you have to, uh, in, ca in order to start a capitalistic system, you have to have a big push in the beginning, where you have to work very hard and spend very little. So a, a strict austerity. We had that here along the East Coast. Throughout the 19th century, masses of European came here. They threw them in the slums, you know. They uh, had no social security, no health care, nothing. Let them work 12, 18 hours and so on. For miserable wages, low wages, high accumulation of surplus value and so on. That is how you get the real push. Later on, the machine rolls by itself, but you have to do the push. And that is what, of course, Eastern Europe had to do again. So they had to do it uh, by 1920s and so on, and then they had to do it again in the 1940s because everything had been destroyed. So now, do you want to do that now? See, and uh, except Romania, no, none of these socialistic leaders was tough enough to impose that austerity program on them and say, you have to have another generation, another 30 years, in order to have that capital, uh, primitive capital accumulation. And so Tito then went to the bank in uh, <coughs> in uh, uh, in Paris, and he took up money, and he built a lot of hotels. By the way, one hotel was a Hotel Leo, where I was for 20 years, and then it was full of refugees in the Civil War. Then I went to the Hotel Argentina. And then the Civil War ended with the victory, the counter-revolution, neoliberal counter-revolution, and it cost 200,000 people in Yugoslavia. And then afterwards, the Ustasha, the fascists who had fled their children and grandchildren, came back and bought it all up. So Hotel Lero, which well, the people owned, and I knew them all, they owned that hotel, and uh, they gave themselves a certain wage, and they put the surplus <coughs> value up. And with that surplus value, they built another hotel, or they added something to their hotel. And, so and they had a manager. They hired a manager, and they fired the manager if he didn't function. And so there was no capitalist anymore. They were free people. And then suddenly they were all uh, coolies again. So I stayed in that hotel, uh, um, Argentina, and it became more and more a bourgeois hotel with uh, unbelievable prices, so the price went up. This year the prices are so much that I cannot possibly pay for it. I would have to pay for my son and myself $600 a night 
six hundred dollars a night. That's how much it is now. Yeah. And so the other one who tell Leo I have to pay hundred dollars a night. That means two hundred dollars a night, but not seven hundred dollars a night. So that means that is what it means to become capitalistic. So now I'm honorary citizen of uh, of, uh, of Dubrovnik because I bought all that food and not food and medicine for five years and so on. So I protest against that. I said, you bastards, you get out with this price now for the hotel that I cannot afford it anymore, so I will not go. I need a swimming pool, but I cannot have a swimming pool. I will go back to Leo and so on. So I made a big noise about this whole thing, but they have now, you know, that counter-revolution, you go back to the old style. So on one side, all these people in all these hotels, Argentina or uh, two, they are now uh, capitalistic coolies again. I mean, that's what ours are. So we don't even understand this because the workers here never were free. So therefore they don't know, they think they are free. So, but they were really free. They determined their own surplus value and had their own self-respect, which is all gone now. Hmm. You can really see they put them into little uniforms in Hotel Argentina of the old emperor and then when I was there the first time I saw that, I said, what, what do you do? You look like funny monkeys there, running around with these golden uniforms and whatever. And, and they whispered, because the manager was sitting up there at the highest level, and they were afraid he could uh, open the window and would hear what they say and so on. So not only that, as far as work is concerned, but also recognition, which we discussed. So, uh, the work was, profit went to other people again, and the recognition went down to zero again. So. <laughs> but the reason was that they built these beautiful hotels. Then in the war, they destroyed them partially again. But already before the war, they were not able to pay the interest back. And so they had to take up new money in order to pay the interest back. And then the interest were even higher, and they could even still pay them less. And so all these countries then were economically conquered without a shot fired in a certain sense. And Romania, who the uh, people of course now hated that guy who uh, imposed that tremendous austerity program on them, he remained debt free. But people finally hated him so much that they killed him. They butchered him and his wife. So uh, um, that is the, you know, the issue of primitive capital accumulation, a very important thing. So. Nevertheless, the, uh, we thought, you know, that we were safe enough, secured enough. Uh, we had forgotten the 1929, 1930 thing, and therefore this neoliberal illusion, we can now go back to this thing. And the Roosevelt, uh, socially modified liberalism is not necessary anymore. We can cancel this social modification. And uh, so that is a Romney speech. You know, there are these 48 percent, they are dependent on the government, you know and the rest of us, we are productive, and so on, and so on, these lazy guys, and these welfare guys, and, and so on, and so on. This same thing came up again, and then, of course, they were hit by 2008, you know, where then people came to the, the same liberal guys came to Bush and said, Mr. President, the economy goes over the brink. That is what they produced, finally. And um, so then he had to start nationalizing. I mean, an extreme neoliberal did the extreme opposite namely to let the government nationalize. And Obama continued that, but he continued it by nationalization of the debts, not the nationalization of the banks, which George Soros, who gives me the money for my students in the Dubrovnik and Yalta, he was against that. He paid Obama in order to nationalize the banks, and not only their debts. So, and this will produce the next catastrophe, you know. We have not only these people in Wall Street were rewarded, but uh, people in Wall Street went into the cabinet, <coughs> uh, the cabinet of Obama, as they are in the cabinets of all other presidents before. So uh, you see that uh, Obama, you know, tries to do that Roosevelt uh, New Deal thing, but you see how hard it is for him to get anything done. I mean, with the gun control now, he he must be happy with the minimum if he gets that, and, and so it is with all the other other things. So, nevertheless, Thatcher belongs into this, and uh, that was her great deed, that she, uh, you know, released the productive forces of capitalism uh, rigorously and tough, and at the same time was a tough anti-communist, and, uh, you know, can is a symbol, uh, together with Reagan, not that they did it all over, the world, with Reagan, a symbol for this successful counter-revolution. And so is 
also uh, John Paul II, who was involved in this, and there you see the neoliberalism and the bourgeoisie is the class which is behind all this. You know, the same class which is behind Hitler, um, Hitler promised, you know, the other two, Paul Strasser, Strasser, you mean Strasser, 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 yeah. Strasser, S-T-R-A-S-S-S-S-E-R. -S 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 so these are the two brothers whom, um, who were more socialistic than Hitler was, and they were pushed out of the fields by Hitler and uh, and then fled, and one of them was killed, as I said. So um, the Strasser brothers, well, good, it came back to me. I'm always happy when something comes back. <laughs> so that is, uh, to yourself. that is the Satcher thing, mm -hmm. and I show you pictures. She looked rather beautiful. And no, um, no, she didn't, Rudy. So, huh? You're too optimistic on that. She, she wasn't beautiful? No, no, of course not. Well, but she became 87 years old. <laughs> That's a great success. Okay, so here it is. There you can see her last time before she would disappear completely. You okay. know, Rudy, you can tell Hotel Argentina that, you know, if they're going to charge $600 a night, yeah. they should really sell real Cuban cigars instead of the fake ones they were selling. Yeah. All right, yes. No, this is a, it's a real scandal. You know, so it's a scandal for, for the uh, you know, for the workers, and also for the consumers. You know, are, where are the rest of the other other participants going to stay at Lero this no, year? No, no, they never did. You know, I had that principle. I never go back in history. So <laughs> therefore, I never wanted to go back to um, to Hotel Leo simply out of this principle. But I did go back two years ago because Hotel Argentina had huge crowds of people in there. So, I mean, there is a huge, uh, uh, wealthy class in yeah. Europe, you know, for them, $700 a night. I mean, that's normal, you know. So, um, so but, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's outrageous, so I, I have to make a point, you know. I could have paid it, but it would be insane to, uh, to yeah. do that, you know, so you're, you're rational. So, I so go back again to... Uh, you know, to the uh, to Hotel Leo. Well, maybe you have to swim in the Adriatic now instead well, of swimming pool. I think pool. Hotel Leo has a swimming pool. Does it? Yeah. That's good. I have to try out. But last, when I was there two years ago, there were still some people there from the old guard. Uh -huh. The guy who carried my suitcase all the time. That's what he did his whole life long. Tiny little man, old already, and he said, this is my last year. So even he will be gone. Yeah. So I will not know them anymore. But... Uh, well, when we came there that, that when that year I went with you, they knew you. Hey, yeah, Professor! Right. Yeah, we, <laughs> we knew each other, knew each other well, yeah. <laughs> And I knew the others, too, there. And uh, and it was, I mean, social, psychological, and it was so sad how these personalities have changed, you know? When when the workers uh, determine their own thought products, you <coughs> know, and then also have that recognition that they are the owners, really the owners, you know? And then suddenly all that changes, and then you see them afterwards. The same people, you know. You see how they have changed in their attire, you know. Looking up there, somebody listens to them. And they, ne they never had that before. So. Now, I, I don't want to romanticize, you know, the socialistic time either. So I was, um, so I, I think the, the self management system uh, that worked for the workers, they owned the airplanes and so on, so they, this was a good thing. But there were deficiencies uh, in it. You know, first of all, this socialism did not go into into to Tito's group. There was a group of politicians on top who were above the self-management system, and the Praxis group who were critical theorists. They were connected with the Frankfurt School, and there was also a group in Hungary who were also connected, and they were all you know considered the young Marx, the humanistic Marx, etc. They wanted to have uh, self-management also up to the top, and not having these gray eminences. So, in in the institute in in Dubrovnik, there was an office. In that office, there was a politician sitting in there, and he watched all the books of the self-managed thing. He could intervene when he wanted to. You know, he was uh, he was humane, and he always he was very friendly. Uh, so, but. Um, uh, he was there, and he was not under this control of this self-management. So they wanted to change that. So, and then um, there were horrible, unbelievable struggle between the Serbs and the Croats. And I was sitting with Ivan Supek, you know, the president of the University of Zagreb, and we became very good friends. But we listened very intensely to the radio, you know, what decisions they would make, you know, and, and also frightened that they could make some. 
decisions and so on. Those, those are laws there too. So one should never, you know, romanticize any system, and one has to be remain critical of it, you know. So I'm, I'm quite sure there's a self-management thing, and then of course there was expropriation. So uh, that means the, uh, the the capitalists, you know, who were there under <laughs> during the fascist time, which was before Tito, you know, they were expropriated and they fled to uh, Argentine and then uh, had accounts, offshore accounts, and they started over there and got very rich, and then came back and bought it all up. And it was the, as we mentioned already, it was the Vatican, because Croatia is Catholic, and it was Germany, because they wanted to get the Yugoslavs out of Germany, and wanted to let them work in Yugoslavia, not in Germany, with the high social costs. And then there was the United States, you know, the uh, order of and the funny thing broke in itself because on one side why I didn't know how much the United States was involved in this counter revolution is because the ambassador in uh, in, uh, in um, the capital there, the third capital, um, I called him and I was there, I was stuck and the airplanes didn't fly, there was general strike and what should I do? And he was more uh, more depressed than I was. I have no idea. You have to get out. I said, get out. How can I get out? The trains don't go. The planes don't go. The buses don't go. I cannot walk. Uh, you know. And I said, well, I don't know. But all it just gave up. You know. But um, his government was at the same time, you know, active in this whole chaos. <coughs> okay. So that was our thing there. Maybe there is another one. Contemporary issues. Um, now we always have with the diagnosis, also a prognosis. Uh, we know now, and we just have to repeat that. You know, when we say diagnosis or prognosis or pathology, these are words we are taken out of medicine, and that means medicine for our body, physical medicine, right? So we make a diagnosis: Do I have cancer, brain cancer, or whatever? And then uh, the uh, from this depends the therapy. I know this organ doesn't function, can I repair that organ, can I use pills, can I make an operation or whatever. Um, so that is the original meaning of it, diagnosis and therapy of these two words. We must be aware that it is already a risky thing when we apply it to, to psychology. So when we say then, you know, we have a diagnosis of a mental illness, it's much more complicated than with the body. We are more sure with the body where we can see, look through the body and so on, than when we say somebody is psychologically ill, they have this diagnosis or have this prognosis if he remains ill, and then therapy either through chemicals through the body or talking, talking psychology where we talk with people and get try to the get to the problem. So it is almost psychoanalysis and quantum physics is psychoanalysis and uh, going through the body, the chemistry, and the physics of the body, get into inside, or to go inside through the words, to the to language, and so on. these are the two methods. Oh, now, why this is so critical? That goes to the core of our of our discourse. Is we have to have a picture in order to say have a diagnosis that this guy is sick. We have to have a picture of what a healthy organism is, and usually uh, it is just a functional type of a thing. That means does this or that organ function adequately and then they quantify it, you know, many times the, the whatever has to happen. Um, so there we are on, on sound crowns or so, but how do you do this now with the psychology? Do we have any kind of a picture of what a healthy psyche is? So also if we uh, already in the physical thing there is some culture involved all the time. What is a healthy person that is always, there is a cultural factor, that means in different cultures, people may consider different people healthy or sick. And that is where hermeneutics comes in, because when the cultural factor comes in, you have to interpret. And the art of interpretation is hermeneutics. So, um, now, but what is a healthy sort? So, if in a fascist state, and we use those three examples all the time, if a fascist state says we kill these people because they cannot live a worthy life, what is a life worth 
living and what not so I go every Sunday to church and before me there sits a young woman she's maybe 30 years old she's in a wheelchair she cannot talk her pants roll her in sometimes the mother whispers in her ear I think she cannot really understand language she has no expressions the hands are all crippled down there somebody dressed her and that is going on and on and on now is this life worth living uh, for the parents obviously the parents take care of her bring her to church and, and so on uh, but that is a cultural thing they are Christians they think that this is the cross which God has given to them and which they have bear, which have to bear that's a cultural thing that's an interpretation of this thing but in another culture in a non-Christian culture pagan culture, fascist culture and so on, you can say what, this is not worth life worth living and so, and so they may even, they cannot even say that she can say prayers you know, sometimes people say, well, the value of her life is that she can pray for the others who feed her. They did that a lot in Germany, when, when people were crippled like this. Uh, but then you need this Christian culture. So, but if it's not there, so what then? So fascism, you know, which is capitalism, uh, the value of somebody is measured by his productivity. <laughs> that means if he or she produces surplus value. This poor woman there sitting before me every Sunday, and that's a real theodicy experience, you know, um, she does not produce any surplus value whatsoever. On top of it, she costs a lot uh, because she cannot work, but she has to be taken care of all the time, <coughs> all the time. And uh, I don't think she can, she cannot go to the toilet, she cannot wash herself, she cannot feed herself, she has to be fed and so on. So, um, so plus, you know, for a minus, first of all, she doesn't produce surplus value, and another minus is uh, whatever uh, that she doesn't produce. Uh, she she costs a lot. She does not produce anything, and she costs a lot. Now that is zero um, uh, level, you know, of capitalism. And that out of this came then the conclusion, you know, that they should uh, should air into the vein of these people, so they made sure it was not a cruel death, it was like they with cats and dogs and so on, they put them to sleep, they were put them to sleep and, and they were sure that it was done in a, in a thing, so we have this fascist euthanasia, we have uh, also of course um, liberal euthanasia, uh, so we have fascist eugenics and we have also liberal eugenics, um, so but the problem with the diagnosis is what is healthy body and that is maybe easier to establish and what is now uh, old age is not a real illness but it's getting weaker and weaker and so on so Hitler never got to the old people if he had had time enough he would have gone up to the old people too he or she cannot produce anything anymore and the, the, the medical costs go up and up and up all the time the more the body disintegrates so therefore this is not worthwhile to you know so uh, I mean the old people nothing was done to them in Germany yet but they would have done something to them by this same type of rationality and um, so the the uh, horrible thing by people were that by the doctors here in spite of the fact that they do the same thing uh, uh, they gave overdose of morphine and so on. The last word which my wife said before she died was to have another shot. That means another shot of morphine. And we didn't use any morphine up to the last hour because if you use it before, it won't work anymore because the body gets used to it and so on. So you, you use it for the last moment and so on. But uh, the, that was there in order to reduce the pain. But it's a tiny little step you know to put one gram more in and you know it turns off the heart and, and so on so and they do that all but why were they not with Dr. Quarkin you know to do it openly with a little machine push a button on it and you can do it yourself and so on <coughs> because of the fascist example because if you say you know what is worthwhile living you suddenly have more and more groups whose life is not worth living 
<laughs> and uh, so they got from these insane people uh, then and to the physically sick people they got suddenly to minorities you know the gypsies they did not produce anything even the homosexuals because they did not procreate for the nation they didn't produce young new <coughs> happy healthy <coughs> powerful creatures and so on so and then of course the communists who uh, they, uh, who denied, you know, the capitalist, the superior guy, the leader, you know, the superman, the capitalist superman. So Hitler was the superman in politics, Ford was the superman in uh, in economics, you know. He over there in Detroit, he put 75,000 men under his control. And when they didn't work disciplined enough, he had thugs who went around with sticks and beat on their heads and so on. That is this great man thing, you know. You have the great man in politics and you have the great man in economics and the communists challenge that you see you damn it great man you live other from other people's work you know to hell with you and so we, you have to work yourself and so the Chinese communists put all the capitalists into their own factories and then they committed suicide because if you are once used to live from other people's work and pay eight hundred dollars you know for a night or whatever and suddenly you have to work yourself again in order to produce these eight hundred dollars uh, then you will not like that. That is the whole hate, you know, against communism. And so on. they they get uh, Hitler writes that in his conversion thing in the first chapters of my struggle, you know. And then Providence gave him that vision, you know. And what does communism do? It uh, does not appreciate the individual, the great individual, the accomplished, and it, it's for the losers and so on. So, on. so there you have it. And that uh, you know to make them equal people. <laughs> that would lead to the total catastrophe of the human species. That's behind fascism, and that's fundamentally also you know, behind liberalism. So fascism uh, is, a, is another step in liberalism. Um, so, you know, so that's why these two are so easy that you can move from one to the other. As I told you before, you know, Hitler, in a few months, you know, he had transformed the Weimar Republic, a liberal state, into a fascist one. And then I was uh, got there, and from I was there from 47, near 48, 49, in three years or whatever, the whole fascist state had been transformed into a liberal one again. And you don't even have to do on the social psychological level, you know, the personality, you don't have to change too much, you know. Social organization, the capitalists were all that free anyway, they could do what they were, they were never attacked really by fascism, they were supported, you know. Hitler opened up the whole Eastern Europe with the fascists like uh, what is this, Schindler? Schindler was one of them. You know, they streamed to these occupied territories and exploited the Poles and the Jews and everybody and got home with big uh, packages full of uh, German marks and, and so on. So, uh, therefore, you don't have to change that. And, and then Adenauer, you know, put all the Secret Service people of the Nazi time, he put them back into the office. All the officers of the army back again and so some of them were a little bit denazified and then they were denazified and they were not Nazis anymore whatever they had done <laughs> and in socialism in Pankow over there they had all the lists of the party members and so whoever was appointed by Adenauer then in Pankow over there they wrote, put them into newspapers and that this, this SS colonel you know over there he just made him you know into the head of the, of the new security forces as well like we had here, you know, the, the guy, the SS Colonel Wander von Braun, you know, we put him up and he got us to the moon and so on. So that's the same thing that the Germans did. And the, the justification was communism. Because the fascists are better than the liberals, even, in fighting communism. So the fascist is better than Thatcher or Reagan you know, to kill communists. And so, more specifically, they were specialists, you know, there, there were many of these Nazi specialists for Eastern Europe or whatever, they were all brought back again, because you need people who know something, and who knew something were all the fascists now, and so they all came back again. <laughs> but did Germany become, West Germany become a fascist country again? No, no, it became a liberal country, but <laughs> they all felt good now, and uh, got richer and richer, you know. Which can also happen, you know, when you change a socialistic state back into a liberal one. Because those oligarchs, you know, who are around there now in Cyprus, the Russian oligarchs, they, they were all communist functionaries. 
And one day they said, well, the factory doesn't belong to the workers anymore, it belongs to me now. <laughs> and they had the know-how. They were managers, so they knew how the factory worked. And so that is how the transition from socialism you know, over. You just have oligarchs now. The functionaries, communist functionaries transform into oligarchs. And then these fascist guys suddenly change over and are liberals again. And shut up, you know, don't talk about it anymore. And the youth movement there, that is the next generation who saw that the dam damn it hypocrisy. And that is when it exploded. My, my and all these people, you know, that was the last generation and they knew what liars their fathers and their and, and what crimes they had committed with which they got away now. And so on. One component too, and that has something to do with the sexuality, we didn't talk about so much, it is a very component too, the differentiation you know, into genders. The, the German uh, system, liberal and fascist, was patriarchal, of course. The, uh, there were little things. When the Americans came in, they were less patriarchal, and so the Germans were amazed when an American officer would push the baby carriage of his little baby. The Germans would say, this is unmanly, that is woman-like, and so on and so on. They couldn't understand it. So, But something hit the Germans much more, and that was they left their women alone when the war came to its end. That means, and that is what Hitler and Goering, and Goebbels, not Goering, but Goebbels saw in Berlin. The, all these guys went on the trucks and went to the West because they didn't want to become prisoners of the Soviets. They wanted to become prisoners of the British and the Americans and the French. They felt closer to them over there. So, and they were all the women. And they were all the children in these houses, you know. And they left. And uh, the women, you know, collectively never forgot this, I think. And it uh, somehow affected the relationship of the genders in Germany up to today. And I think for the rest of history that... Uh, this catastrophe happened all along the Eastern Front that happened and then uh, I know when I came home and I had been trained here and I went to Heilbronn in the prison camp and there I was released and then I took a train to Frankfurt and there were some women sitting there and, uh, and they told me this whole thing what happened you know that now the women they were all going to the Americans um, because they had chocolate and, and so on but also you know Americans, they attracted because of the food, but they also were alienated from their own husbands because they had lost the war, and they did not protect them against the enemies and so on. So to hell with them. Uh, so this is a very um, you know deep seated type of a thing sociologically. Yeah, there's a <coughs> massive amount of rapes by the Red Army. Yeah, but the everyone women. has to be careful. Do we want to be you know we don't want to fall into any propaganda thing. So there were two armies, you know. One was the Southern Army. The Southern Army came two weeks earlier, and they came from Siberia, and they um, behaved very beastly. I mean, they behaved so beastly as the fascist press had said they would behave. And that is the picture which the soldiers who left their women behind, that's the picture which they had to have, you know, because that was the official propaganda. But the propaganda was not really adequate enough. In an army, um, what Katya never wants to believe, I think Spengler was right, we are killers. Uh, that means it's unconscious and we usually don't kill anybody, but a lot of us do kill other people and the prisoners are full, but some of us are civilized enough and so the killer instinct is modified or is repressed or sublimated or whatever, but when armies march against each other, and uh, I had this fantastic experience, you know, which you hopefully would never have and didn't have, uh, that when armies, two armies, I mean, these people don't know each other, but then according to some strategy or what, they are moving against each other in all details, in terms of uh, reconnaissance and how to see where the enemy is and then the strategies from where you grasp them, how you can encircle them, and so on. And then also for the senses, the noise, the smell, the uh, cries, the scream, and so on, and so on. So this whole thing, and uh, somehow uh, that could not happen, and that's my argument with Katya all the time, <laughs> that could not happen if there was not a potential in it. 
you can say about the sergeant whatever you know or behaviorism be conditioned people so overnight they you know they suddenly become killers but they could not be made overnight into killers by no method whatsoever psychologically or sociologically if there was not a tremendous potential in there that killing is lustful and that it is something tremendously enjoyable the same will sex sex this that both components of the id are uh, similar in a certain way that the release of energy is always uh, experienced as a pleasure and the repression which civilization requires remember critical theory is a study of the civilization and how they come about you know that the repression in for instance in work in order to do work you know you have to repress whatever else you want to do you don't want to do the work but you have to do the work in order to eat something and so on so this repression is felt as being painful, uncomfortable, and so on. And uh, when this can be released, what you are forbidden to do, now you can do it and you get a decoration for it. When you do it and uh, you have a, a nice iron cross hanging there, when you go home to the girls, <coughs> the girls will uh, glorify you and you will have them all and you can sleep with them all and so on and so on. So and what the with the girls play in the killing is, is, is important. The more you kill, the bigger you will be for them, and so on. And there it becomes all nature, brutally. I mean, the riddle of nature, you know, even for those who believe in the Creator God, and particularly for them, it's a great riddle. <laughs> so, nevertheless, the, um, yes, I mean, about this rape thing, and so on. Then, um, Chukov, the dialectician, had been that guy who did Stalin quite in Kursk, and therefore Stalin wanted him to take, to make the last strike. He had broken the backbone of the German army, and he was supposed to enjoy this now by taking Berlin. But he was stopped by SS division and by the population in Latvia and the, by the, uh, along the, uh, what is the Balkan, not the Balkan, the other, what is it, what is the lake up there, the sea? Um, the Gulf of Finland. Up there. Yeah, right, the uh, Gulf of Finland, but how's the whole thing called there? Then? Well, along that ocean there. The Baltic? Baltic Sea, the yeah, Baltic yeah. Sea which goes down to Warsaw, where I taught so the, this uh, whole area, it took uh, Kuchov, uh, Chukov, Chukov more time than he thought, so he was two weeks too late in Berlin. And then he marched in and his troops behaved uh, quite differently. So they helped the women, you know, to get water and you know, some food and so on. So oh, we have to have the balanced view and it is, uh, it is very difficult, you know, because of that mechanism of arrows and thanatos, as Marcuse uh, calls that call that because of its connection it is very important that when the killer instinct is at work and death is closed then it's opposite the only opposite against death is sex and therefore to to um, to discipline armies not to rape or whatever it's a very difficult thing uh, I was part I was in, in Holland while Germ uh, Germans occupied Holland and so on the Germans had very strict uh, rules of non fraternization and there were no illegitimate children whatsoever. They were able to, to pu push through that discipline. British came later on and the Americans and the whole thing full of uh, illegitimate children <laughs> and so on and so on. But the British, and they, they, they killed less, you know. Than, uh, but there were other things, not only sex was discipline, but also having, you know. So, so I had a friend, he just died very recently, and, uh, well, friend, he was part of my crew who came to Holland in order to learn to fly, and so and So he went to a store, Dutch store, you know, and so, and then he took something, took it out, a tiny little thing, maybe 10, 20 cents or whatever, and the officer found out, you know, and right away he had, was taken by the officer, had to go, I mean, we're young guys, we're just 16 years old, but he took him there, and he had to bring it back. And then he was shipped home to Frankfurt. He could not stay in the unit anymore. So there was a tremendous, uh, I mean, libido is not only sex, it is also commodities and so on, you know, tremendously strained. But then on the other hand, when you repress that, then the killer instinct comes out on the other side, even worse, or the power instinct or whatever. That is this tragedy with solibitarians, you know. If they are not, you know, like the Gautama, the Buddha, well trained about the will to life then when you repress one thing it comes out on the other side 
So suddenly you have a pastor who is very chaste, but he wants to have money, money, money all the time. Or you have someone who suddenly wants to have power and power and, and thrones over people, you know, and uh, thinks he is God Almighty and so on. So that is the dangerous thing when, when it is. Uh, so that's the, the East invented asceticism. <coughs> and asceticism is the science to, uh, to know how the will to life functions, you know, with the imitations. And from there we had a Schopenhauer and so on. And so Cartier always thinks he's the old philosopher, they're all dead and so on. <laughs> And that is the attitude of sociology, of course, science, right? So no metaphysics anymore, and so on and so on. But they were not stupid, you know. The Gautama was not stupid, and uh, and and uh, Schopenhauer was not stupid, or whatever. So we have a dialectical attitude. Of course, science negated philosophy, but it also preserves it, and it has to preserve it in order not to become unproductive, and shallow, and boring. So, and the same thing is true for philosophy. It negated religion and so on, but it never negated it completely. In reality, you know, great philosophy is the same damn it catechism, just on another form, you know, another level. So, um, that, uh, so, well, you know, this is where, <coughs> where we really have to reflect on, on our discipline there, where it stands. You know, one can do sociology in different ways, and I think if you know where these sciences come from, for instance, sociology from social philosophy and social philosophy from religious morality and so on and so on. It's better you have a much fuller, much more concrete uh, uh, concept of the science and, and that's just it's more meaningful too. And it's more attractive uh, as well. <coughs> okay, so um, that, uh, but I want to say this about this rape thing and, and the Soviets and so on. The, uh, it was very strange. In Rostock, when I talked there, in the communist time, I saw uh, there was uh, Russian soldiers were stationed there, and they were not allowed to go out alone, out of the barracks. So, when you saw them in the streets, they were always 20 together, and they always had an officer with them. I mean, they never had the German army. But they, all, when they went to this thing or to a restaurant or whatever, they were always a group, in the group, there was always an officer who watched what they were doing, and then they took him back again to the barracks. Or so, so that was one way of uh, of disciplining people. But all armies, you know, have this have this problem, and, and, and people say they behave that way and rape that way. Um, we had here in Norfolk, you know, when people were drafted, and the soldiers from Norfolk they were shipped to Europe. There were thousands of women who came there, and and uh, you know wanted to get married and wanted to have a child and whatever. They also wanted to have the pension <laughs> in case they would not come back or whatever. So it, uh, there are all kinds of, you know, motifs at work. But the more, the closer death is, the more errors there is. Um, if you have, for instance, uh, homes for people who have a lung illness or whatever, the sexuality thing goes right away up because of the threat of death and so on. So. Uh, that is something deep in us, and there you can also see that one shouldn't look down on mythology. Mythology is a way of thinking, and the Greeks, you know, produced unbelievable thoughts in form of their mythology and their 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 images uh, in a very disciplined way. I mean, if you read Antigone or so, every sentence has its own meaning. It's not science; it's another language. But in this other language, things are expressed which we still cannot adequately express with our sciences. Or also poets who have the same thing, you know, the Dostoevsky or Tolstoy and so on. They are extremely beautiful, good uh, sociologists or psychologists. The question is only we don't know how the hell they got there. We don't know his metho methodology. We don't know what intuition is. And you have a skinner box, you have a little rat and the little rat runs back and forth between the electrode and the food, and then you see something, and then you have certainty. This certainty is missing. We don't know how Dostoevsky got into the soul of a killer of two old women or whatever, uh, or, you know, how Tolstoy got into Napoleon or in his opponent, the general, and so on. And so, uh, how Anna Karenina, how one can get into the soul of Anna Karenina, and so on. So, that is... Uh, we don't know that, but is that the reason now that we said this is not science 
and science is the only source of truth, and therefore we don't read Tolstoy, and we don't read Dostoevsky, we don't read Shakespeare or whatever. Uh, that's not, that cannot be the right thing. I think the right thing is that science, as science one can make what was there before, but one has to preserve something too. And one can say, okay, this guy said, said something, maybe what he saw, or however, maybe we can verify also empirically, or something like that, you know, would be a way to... to so, okay, that was one thing, contemporary issues, the other one is this Korea thing there. Um, there's all over the place. And CNN is just, just become hysterical about this whole thing, and I don't know why why that is going on. No other station, not even Fox, is so wild about this Korean thing there. But let me do something else which uh, Dustin can explain to us and uh, make Dustin happy there. Uh, because um, there is our friend Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad cannot run for office anymore. He has now three terms are over, so somebody else will come in. And he has a good friend, and this friend, he wants to have him in the um, in the office. And obviously he cheated a little bit in order to stay in the office a second time. Now this time, he doesn't want to have any cheating anymore, because he thinks when there is no cheating, then his friend will have a will have a better chance to. So when we go with our di di diagnosis here, and uh, now remember again, I have to take one more step. <laughs> when we want to know what a sick body is, we have to know what a healthy one is. If we know want to know what a sick <coughs> diagnosis, what a sick psyche is, we have to have some kind of image what a healthy science, science, psyche is. So for Freud, a healthy psyche was one who could keep a job all the time and was not fired and could keep his marriage and would not get divorced. That These two things, they're very down to earth and that is a healthy guy who can do this and everybody else is not so healthy. So, But now we have to take one step m more, further. What in God's name is a healthy society? There we really have a problem now. See, and uh, can one society say about the other, you are not healthy? Or can we only have inner criticism or inner diagnosis? And then we can say, we can judge a society only by its own values. And if it conforms to its own values, then it's healthy. But if not, then it is sick. But what we do now with, uh, with North Korea is, you are sick, you guys, because you are not like us. You know, that is that is where it becomes all horribly confusing. And that then one goes into the Near East, you know, and says, you people, you are not democratic. You are not separating church and religion, the Ummah and, and the state, and so on. Therefore, you are, something's wrong with you. You are sick people, how you treat your women, and so on, and so on. See, that is all where one takes the self-image of a civil society and applies it to a socialistic society or a traditional society or a historical intermediate society like Saudi Arabia. So, uh, and, uh, so we just have to be aware of this. We are doing time diagnosis, time prognosis. We are talking about a pathology and therapy, but it is different on the level of the body the level of the psyche and the level of society. And it's most complicated on the level of society. Okay, let's look at this now. So we want to look at this. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini has, uh, that is the most, the highest guy who sits beyond those. So they have a French constitution, and it's interesting. So we have um, uh, um, theocracy, the theocracy, Allah rules, but he rules through the mullahs, and he rules through a parliament, a French parliament. And in Iraq we have the same, it is a theocracy, like the Vatican, but uh, it rules through the mullahs, and then through an American constitution. Uh, so that already, you know, is that entirely healthy? <laughs> that would be a question, right? But we want to be caref careful about this. But now, this guy, Mashai, 
Mashai is the opponent, uh, well, he will run, and uh, it is the uh, fellow whose name I can never pronounce there, Ahmadinejad. He wants to have this Mashai to come in there, into the wall. Now, there is something wrong with this guy. <laughs> so, the question is, what is wrong with him? According to what? According to the Ayatollah Khomeini. And what is wrong with the guy is that he is a heretic. <laughs> he is a heretic. <laughs> because so why is he is a heretic? He is a heretic because he is somehow in direct contact with the Mahdi. The Mahdi is the guy who will come before the Jesus Messiah comes. So that is the Shiite version of the whole thing. It's the Shiite eschatology, uh, according to which uh, the Mahdi, the, that is uh, figure from, from Mohammed's time, and he somehow has survived, but he will come into the open, and then there will be horrible chaos, and bombing, and war, and so on. And only then the Jesus Messiah can come, and then there will be salam, then there will be peace. So that is the idea. Now, obviously, uh, the Ayatollah Shomini doesn't think that way, and so he is somebody who is not really orthodox, and therefore he doesn't want to have him there. So th that means that is this, the Mahdi is that hidden imam, and uh, doesn't know all this, and uh, who will return so soon. And then together with Jesus, he will redeem humankind. <coughs> and uh, this, um, <laughs> this, this fellow there, this Mashai, he has uh, the German, German newspaper. Says, he has a direct wire to the Mahdi. <laughs> he has a direct wire to the Mahdi. There you hear what the secular press is saying about holy things. So he has a direct wire to him, and um, so therefore. Since he has this direct wire to the Mahdi, he doesn't need the clergy. That means he is independent, spiritually independent from the clergy. So the, uh, the, the Ayatollah cannot reach him because he said, I don't need your damned Ayatollahs, I have the Mahdi. I have direct contact with him. As somebody is saying, I don't need any Pope because I'm in contact with Jesus. I found him every day. So why the hell do I need this whole damned priesthood? It's not, I mean, Luther did something similar like this. He also suddenly had direct contact and didn't need the Pope anymore. And then the Pope can even become an Antichrist. So this is the, uh, you know, that is what you have when you have this, uh, um, this theocracy thing, you know. The question is how you get from this theos, this God, down to, well, where you are. And uh, so there is this guy who has this... Uh, particular contact, and uh, they think the guy is in power now, he may also have this uh, this uh, secret line there, wire to the to the Mahdi, so so, uh, nevertheless, that is the thing, and I think this uh, eschatology uh, can be very powerful when some people are um, uh, somehow uh, they can become very dangerous, and we have these cases, you know, where, where all the, not all the rich, no, it was the other thing where, you know, 70 people were burned there, right? That was some kind of an eschatological guy uh, down in, where was it, in Texas or where? Oh, in Waco, Texas? Texas? In Waco, yeah, in Waco. Waco. Davidians. And then we had Davidians, and then we had also in South America where these 900 people they trained. Jim right? Jones. Or whatever, Jones. They drink um, cool Yeah, it. so uh, somehow, you know, when people are, particularly the fourth estate, the people, you know, live from the hand in the mouth or from welfare and so on, and desperate, life situation, when somebody comes and says, he is coming, he's coming, you know, let's get out of it's coming soon, let's go there, and, uh, you know, then we'll see him, and that is very, very attractive, and I think that is what they are frightened of. Yeah, so also, it, uh, reading something also says that he actively promotes nationalistic themes and ideas and puts emphasis on Iran's pre-Islamic past, uh, yeah. much to the disdain of the Republic's conservative establishment, but... I mean, in that sense, he's going to be closer to the Shah, because that's precisely what the yeah. Shah did. It was emphasized nation and pre-Islamic Persian past. Yeah. I mean, then when we, when this, yeah, and they have made a movie, by the way, you know, about this Persian background, and uh, have opposed it 
to our picture, which is Greek to a large extent, you know, we have this tradition from the freedom of one to the freedom of few, you know, to democracy and all that, and they, uh, you know, emphasize the Zoroastrianism and Cyrus, 500 before, you know, was a real great fellow. He had already civil rights declaration, and so they say, you will think with the French Revolution is nothing, you know, we have that already 500 years before, the common era, and so what are you talking about? And so, so that is part of this, you know. But it would, of course, be contradictory because that Mahdi thing, that's a special, specific, you know, Islamic uh, thing which wasn't there before. No, the Specifically for the Shia. Yeah. Specifically for yeah, the Shia. Yeah, Shiites, yeah, exactly. Yeah. By the way, with my class, I had to be careful. I visited the Sunnis and <coughs> and I didn't want them to have the impression that I neglected the uh, the Shiites. Most of them in the class are Sunnis, but um, you know, I didn't want the others to feel bad. Uh, I went to the others already twice, and they were very, very hospitable and very nice, and were very eager, you know, that we would visit them and would not. They are persecuted, you know, at the moment. They were under dying in Iraq and uh, another one in especially in Bahrain. Pakistan, yeah. In Bahrain, it's really bad. Yeah, right. Okay, now let's step back for a moment. So our <coughs> uh, topic was here Iran. <laughs> we um, uh, want to do a time diagnosis, uh, more specifically, the pictures are there, I give them to you, and we have changed in power, and so uh, we see that uh, without enforcing anything, we see that religion obviously plays a role, and that this religious eschatology can be very powerful, and I think Ahmadinejad uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, has the same similar belief. Uh, that's why they are friends. They somehow met 20 years ago, and they they both are in contact with Mahdi, and um, mm. that gives them independence toward the um, toward the ruling group, which stands between them and Allah, in the theocracy. Uh, and but it may also for us, for others outside, you know, uh, it may not be easy because whatever we can threaten them, we say you know, we'll, uh, the Israelis will bomb your atomic energy complexes or whatever, uh, it will not bother them because that is when Mahdi comes. That will be part of it. So they expect it in a certain way. As a matter of fact, it could go first. They could invite it in a certain sense, you know, and say, well, and, and could, uh, you know, develop a rhetoric or have developed a rhetoric toward Israel or toward the United States, which will be very aggressive because they think that's how history will go. Uh, okay, they will bomb us, you know, this is part. When Marty comes, that is what will happen. You know, there, there are Christians too who have the book of Revelation, you know, before the Messiah comes, there will be all kinds of turmoil and the three horsemen and uh, all kinds of bad things will happen. So that makes them immune against threats. So that's right. <laughs> so also, <laughs> not only immune, it makes them think well because they put up uh, an embargo on them, an oil embargo, in order to starve them out. But they increased their oil, um, their oil thing, their oil sales, sales of their oil. So they have more money now than they had before the embargo. That means they have found some satanic ways to go around the embargo. And one thing is, well, people who are on our side who do this pu publishing there, the Indians. The Indian people say we cannot live without the Iranian oil. So they buy it <laughs> and, and don't obey the embargo which the UN has imposed on them. So, uh, so it's, uh, I mean, this eschatology, you know, gives them the quietness of the soul <laughs> which they can really think through well and uh, don't fall into a panic because they are prepared. The Mahdi comes, and uh, therefore that's how it will be. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we have it. There you can see the two. They look like good two good friends. Okay. And now I have one thing more, and two things more. Then, and that is this North Korean thing, and we started that already. <coughs> and uh, Kesan is an important thing. So. Oh, in, in overall, 
we are concerned now not with the uh, historical intermediate society, not with the liberal society, not with the fascist society, but with the socialistic society. So the United States, about two years ago with Obama, made a decision that our real interests are not in the Near East, and they have somehow flagged it down, but that our real interest is Asia. And they have begun to put ships there and rockets, particularly in Guam, and also into Japan, and also in the South uh, thing, in the South Korea. At the same time, they had now a big maneuver. Now they have a maneuver every year, the Allies, the West. And whenever they have a maneuver, the other little guys in North Korea are shouting and screaming. There are only 20 million, 20 million little people. And there is one in a billion, one more than a billion Chinese sitting up there. And uh, the two Americas are so in, in Japan and so on. There's also over a billion people and so on. So they are sitting there among massive flocks of people. And so what are you doing when you are a little frog and you sit there and they make a maneuver right before you in front of your door? So <coughs> then you blow yourself up, you know, like a little frog, you know, to be bigger. And, that, and then you say, I have these wagons and I have a rocket on it and I can drive them around. <laughs> and, so, and then, uh, unfortunately, they went further. They sank a boat. They sank a ship with 40 people on it so a few years ago. And the West did not retaliate somehow. Um, and then they also shot at an island there, and they were quiet too. But now they have a 30-year-old guy, and he looks like a little frog too. And he blows himself up bigger and bigger. And uh, so um, Obama said, you know, we have to get the tone down, and maybe we got our tone up as they did. So, I mean, there's some reflectivity in, in Obama. He says, you know, okay, he's shouting and screaming around, but... But maybe we were shouting and screaming around a little bit too much neither also, and that was a nice, uh, reasonable thing. And, but they sent these airplanes which have only wings, they don't have a body anymore, the black things, the stealth bombers, and they send them there, so all that looks very frightful. And so this guy, every day he wants to blow up something in, in order to show how big he is. So. <coughs> and he has some leverage because the capital of South Korea is only a few miles away from the border, so, and there are, I think, 12 million people living in Apple, and the north is only 20 million, so they, that means all of South Korea is almost living right at their border, and uh, they do have a lot of shelters, but if they would start uh, even artillery fire or whatever, they could do horrible damage, so, and therefore it is, it is, uh, you know, it's difficult, so, <laughs> but, now, what we are concerned with now is with our diagnosis that we mentioned already, you know. <laughs> we are a capitalistic country. That is a communist country. We call it Stalinistic. How Stalinistic it really is is another question. Then we have another socialistic country, China. So we want to get those two against each other. So we say always the Chinese should restrain those Koreans, but they are both communists, so they are brothers. So how much restraining there is there? So <coughs> in China, I think the little guy shouldn't blow himself up so much, so they want to calm him down. <laughs> but he goes <coughs> on shouting and screaming, and so the, they cannot even do that to calm him down, really. So, but there is a certain solidarity between communistic countries now that has to get in, uh, into our head, you know, uh, so that we have another ruling class. We have a capitalistic ruling class, which Americans don't know but they rule the whole mass media and so on, and therefore CNN and so on shouts and screams all the time like the little guy in North Korea shouts and screams and so on. So, uh, and uh, the question is now, you know, if we say this is our propaganda and so that's not true, so can we get to the truth in some way? And there, um, in terms of pathology, you know, we talked about our pathology um, and then when we say when we talk about our pathology, we have to have a measure by which we can say that our society is sick. Now, <coughs> when we say, for instance, you know, our constitution contains our values and so on. So, if we live up to our constitution, we are, in our relative way, we are a healthy nation, at least to some extent. So, but since the Second World War, we have had 25 wars 
and none of them was declared by Congress. It was all con declared by the President. So, the, the, in a certain sense, Congress is not functional. You could put it to the sickness, you know, into <coughs> functional terms, and you could say, you know, this type of behavior, not to obey your function whenever you, 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 um, uh, you know, your constitution, whenever these crises are coming up, that is not healthy. So, um, and so, the the other thing is, you know, that we say everybody, you know, has a right to happiness and health and, and so on and so on, and there are millions of people who don't have a chance to happiness and so on. Whatever that is, one would also have to formulate this, what happiness is. And you see, behind all that is something which is between Hegel, or from Plato, Aristotle to Hegel, and then the break which comes afterwards, and particularly in the public sphere and so on. We have that now people say, I have evolved, and therefore I accept now uh, homosexuals or whatever, or I uh, I accept now uh, uh, Clinton had this evolution they evolved, but we don't know what this evolution is all about because uh, <laughs> um, public opinion is changing. So I mean, but is public opinion now vox populi or vox dei? You know, is it just uh, that the masses, you know, somehow think, well, we did this now. They are nice guys, these homosexuals, they're marching around and they love each other, so everybody has the right to love each other, so why shouldn't they, and so on and so on. But this, is that really enough, you know, to, uh, uh, to now to change value? So where, is there any measurement, you know? Okay, cultural determination, that's all right, but is there something behind that cultural thing there? And there we discussed that already. Protocol sentences, yeah, which we have, you know, it's dark now, or whatever. That's simple. But when we become judgmental, when we judge, then we judge a thing with itself. That means North Korea with itself. Is it in conformity with itself? But that is a metaphysical sentence. And we are not supposed to met be metaphysical. To be scientific means to have left metaphysics and philosophy and theology and all that behind, and to hate it even. <coughs> well, that's fine. But now we don't know anymore, you know, how one really knows ultimately if a society is healthy or not, or if it is identical with itself. If we want to replace metaphysics and say we don't think of the state, like an idea of the state like Plato had, and then we measure that real state and it doesn't fit or whatever. So we could change it, you know, in a post hegelian sense and say, okay, we use inner criticism instead. We are not metaphysicians anymore. We don't have the Platonic or the Aristotelian or Hegelian idea of a state anymore. We cannot penetrate it, we don't know. We, we only know what subjectively happens or what a society does, but we have no universals anymore. We are nominalists, we are positivists, and so now we can say, okay, we have that constitution, and we follow this constitution, that is what it means to be socially healthy in the United States, and when we deviate, then something is sick, and then we have to need a the therapy, and we have to see when we make the next war, that we ask Congress first, and then ask, like Roosevelt went to the Congress and said, United States Congress, the Empire of Japan has attacked us furiously, and so on, in, uh, in, in whatever, in Hawaii, and now uh, we have to, I ask Congress to declare war against the uh, Empire of Japan. <coughs> that was healthy uh, in the Constitution now, and so on. So, but then we would also have to be willing now to do the same thing with North Korea. That means we would have to say, is North Korea uh, identical with itself? Not in a metaphysical sense, but in the sense of socialism, the sense of a socialistic state, and whatever it promises and what its constitution is, and not saying they are starving their populations, and, and then these starving people at the same time they show pictures of hundreds of trucks with unbelievably expensive rockets on top of it and so on. So, I mean, they cannot totally starve because if they 
starve, they couldn't build all that stuff. And then they wouldn't have the money to build all that stuff in that shot. So but, but doesn't in that <coughs> criticism fall into the same essentialist trap that Platonism does? Because once you say that there is a particular you you're yeah. claiming that there's an essence to the constitution yeah. right. or there's an essence to yeah. socialism rather than yeah. well what I want to do is uh, I, I don't want to do the essentialist thing in terms of metaphysics now, right? Because Plato and Aristotle and the whole tradition, you know, up to Hegel and so on, they, and even when Marx talks about the necessity with which things happen in history, when he talks about the necessity of history, he has some notion of history which is a res residual of what once was theology and metaphysics. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go uh, away from that and are scientific, as sociologists, you know, we could say that the North Vietnamese have a culture. Well, if there is something essential, it is established by them. It is not an objective, uh, universal or whatever. So, and we would say the same thing with ourselves. So we don't have any absolutes anymore. We don't have any universes anymore. We don't, they don't. But they have posited something, see. So they have posited a culture by which we can measure them. We could not uh, we could not be blamed to be metaphysicians now instead of positivists, right? Because it has something to do with what is humanly positive and not something which is there before, as the sociologists say, constructed in the Kantian sense, you know. I guess I was calling it essentialist, but I guess I'm thinking in terms of when someone tries to apply inner criticism, yeah. they are claiming some kind of privileged access to what whatever it is that they're judging yeah, yeah. actually means. And so that hermeneutic yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, term right, yeah. Okay, ends that's up essentializing yeah. an entire culture <laughs> right. or a tradition. Okay, there, there is, since it is a cultural thing, there's hermeneutics involved and there's interpretation involved. So we would have to make sure, you know, what they say when they say from everybody to everybody according to his need, from everybody according to his ability, and so on, which is a fundamental socialistic sentence, you know, or what they think uh, in that private appropriation of uh, collective labor, but collective appropriation of collective labor. We could ask, what does that really mean? Do they really mean still what the New Testament said in the Acts, or what Marx said, who got it from there, uh, or do they have a new meaning for this now, <coughs> and so on, right? But um, we would not simply, you know, m measure them by our standards now, you know, in terms of how people should um, work or how they should live or, or how they should eat or how they should behave or how they should defend their country and so on. But you're absolutely right. So we have to, uh, we cannot simply say, <laughs> we judge North Korea according to its constitution or whatever. There is some something else which has to be done. We must be sure that we understand their, um, their constitution as they understand it. And that is difficult with us even, because with us there are always lawyers and there's a Supreme Court to me and to interpret the constitution differently from somebody else. But, but there are limits to it. I mean, it's not impossible to um, ask, you know, the North Koreans um, about their constitution or about the socialistic worldview, and if they still understand that, like Marx did, or if they have modified it, you know, to through the Chinese or wherever they got their communism from, you know, so that is there is a there is a hermeneutical problem there, without doubt. But we would not become metaphysicians, you know. Uh, in any case, we would now uh, ask them what they mean, what their culture is. And if we understand their culture right, this type of procedure, this hermeneutics, is not metaphysics. I mean, you can make everything metaphysics. I mean, I can say that the positivists themselves are metaphysicians when they say, for me, valid and true is only what is the case. That is really, that I would say, positivism is the metaphysics of what is the case. But you have, from one positivistic generation to the other, the always blame the last generation from still being metaphysics. You know, and so one has to free themselves from the last residuals of metaphysics and theology. Okay, if we want to do that, and we want to 
go along with this, and it's an element of enlightenment, uh, then uh, we say inner criticism, we don't shout anybody, uh, you have been a physician or so, but we want to see what they have posited, what their laws are, what their values are, and fundamentally that can be understood. You know, we can travel there, people have traveled there, obviously the Americans who do understand them, there was a sports guy who just went there, you know, he got along with them very nicely. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there were three or four visitors in recent years who went there and understood them very well, so... Yeah, but I think, I think Kim Jong-un thought that was Obama. <laughs> and I think I think Dennis Rodman thought that was Jackie Chan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, that's part of her minuti. <laughs> I, I guess in terms of theoretical tradition, they yeah. have unambiguous like rules. <laughs> Inner makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, right. But okay. to to say that oh. I'm going to judge the whole country of North Korea or the North Korean government yeah. as like a thing based on. Yeah a document or a set of values that uh, we're proposing that yeah. they monolithically hold yeah. on to. Yeah. I, that's, that's where I have a hard time. Okay, and yeah, you had, to, had that problem before, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, see, but when we say judgment, you know, we mean a differentiation between what people actually do and then what they confess to. So in a certain sense what disturbs you may, may mean that we hold somebody to what he confesses to. We hold his feet to the fire. And you would like to have the freedom that somebody says, you know, that is what we believe in, but we do the opposite. And we are free to do the opposite. Right? So, so therefore when we say, how do we know that uh, North Vietnam is pathological? We say we don't c compare their existence with our values, but we compare their existence with their values. But then you still have a problem and say, we cannot do this, right? Because you are a very individualistic person and you think the society can set up some values and at the same time individuals can say to hell with it. And each, like, different subgroups within Sub a society too, yeah, right. are obviously going to have different interpretations and that's yeah. how they're gearing their own practices yeah. based on values, whether yeah. they're stated or not. They could be implicit values yeah. within a subgroup within a culture, and then judging those people based yeah. on a, a larger right. like notion of what is the, yeah. the values. I mean, there is, I mean, positivistic thing now. Let's see, you have in China, you have a communistic society, and there are some Christians who are conformed to this, and there's no problem. But there are some Christians who are on the underground, who do not conform to it, and they may, may be policed and so on. Now, if we talk as sociologists about a society as a whole, or the system as a whole, we can uh, keep neutral for a moment, you know, all the subsystems there, uh, because, you know, the whole thing is a reality in itself. <coughs> it's not, it doesn't consist of the parts, it is more than the parts. And so one can study a society with neglecting subgroups or, or individuals for the time being, they are everywhere. There are some nonconformists. There are idealists who think that is not enough. There are people in prison, and there are insane people. These three groups will not conform to the overall culture. It's a, mm, because they are sick, they can. The others could, but they don't want to. They are in prison. And then there are some people who say, you know, my culture and these values, that is not really human. I am a humanist. I want to have more than this. And they may also go to prison and they could do otherwise, they should, could shut up, and so on. But I think it is fair to say that there is such a thing as a totality, that this <coughs> is a socialistic state, and it has made statements which we can read, so they are empirically there. And then we know that there are millions of people who follow this, but there are some people who do not follow them. But in order to study that totality of the thing, you cannot atomize it or so. Um, you can think, you know, this is an American culture, this is the American constitution. Um, and they have a constitution the same way, and this constitution is a product of Marxism, I'm quite sure, so of a philosophy which is called Marxism, and we have a philosophy called liberalism and so on. Now, if um, so many people are there who don't even know this, or have never learned this, or 
these are neglect these are factors which we can neglect for the time being uh, and can still study the totality which is called the American society or the North Korean society um, and, and say therefore you know uh, that is a healthy society somehow because there is no private poverty therefore everybody is asked you know to uh, give uh, as much as he according to his ability uh, we educate them we have an educated system to develop their abilities we pay for all of this for education and therefore they um, therefore they should deliver and uh, others are needy and they have a right that their needs are fulfilled they eat, drink, uh, educated and health insurance and so on so, and uh, we could not say now you know, they are not liberal, therefore they are sick we would have to say, you know, do they follow their own socialistic philosophy not perfectly, probably you know, but to um, acceptable amount like, like here too, I mean I mean, we have problems with the Constitution, but most Americans hold on to the Constitution, to the amendments, and to all the laws which are connected with it, national and international. And there are always people who have trouble with them, and we put them into prison. We have more prisoners than anybody else. But we would not judge, you know, society by its prisoners, or by its insane asylums, or so, but rather by the code according to which they say they live. So that we do not impose our stuff on them, that is important, but, um, but that we ask them what they consider to be healthy, a healthy society, or a good society, or society which makes the individuals, enables the individuals to fully develop themselves. You know, these are all uh, expressions of a value concept. Mm -hmm. So as scientists, we may not have a value, we may not have values like uh, Max Weber would say, not Emil Durkheim, but um, but we know that the people whom we study, they do have values, and we know that they are not value free. Nobody is value free, as a matter of fact. They uh, follow, you know, to some extent at least their values. So for us, the question is, you know, diagnosis, um, pathology, therapy. And if these concepts, which come from medicine, you know, if they can apl be applied not only to the body, but also to the psyche, it's already problematic, and then furthermore to society, and becomes even more problematic. So we, we don't uh, deny, you know, the problem which is involved in all of this. Um, but if we don't want to be metaphysical, if you are metaphysical, you would say, there is a certain concept or image of the state and I apply this now to the United States and to North Korea and to everything else because this idea is absolute, it's perfect and, and so on <coughs> and whatever cultural variations there are they also have to be measured by this uh, by this idea, you know, which Plato had or Astral had or Hegel had so um, because that is what the struggle is against this metaphysical tradition, you know. We don't want to be metaphysicians anymore. This is the first country without metaphysics here. And therefore we have these great problems for it, you know, mm -hmm. with it. So then, if pathology is diagnosed or determined using inner criticism, mm -hmm. which means that you kind of can align what people are saying and what they're doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would not, like, particularly effective societies like the way that the, the Nazis move, like mobilized their ideology, mm -hmm. is that not like the healthiest system possible yeah. if, if you're instrumentally effective? Mm -hmm. Isn't that a, a good indication that you're okay, not? I mean, we should apply it then, and we would have to apply inner criticism to, uh, to, to fascism, you know, so um, if we look at the Nuremberg trial, you know, have these people been judged by their own values or have they been judged by the Russian judges in terms of socialism, by the liberal judge in terms of liberalism, you know, and they gave the chance, the liberal chance, to uh, Goering to talk two weeks, two weeks, and make the fascist point of view clear, you know. 
and uh, also, you know, Goering and his Jewish psychoanalyst and so on, you know. So the psychoanalyst comes in and Goering says, very friendly and nicely, you are a Jew. Yes, he said, I'm a Jew. He said, you'll never understand us. <laughs> but uh, the psychologist, you know, understood them all and wrote big books about them and so on. So, so uh, the, uh, I mean, we have to be uh, strict with ourselves now. So what, to what extent, you know, what, where, what were the culture, what was the culture of the fascists? What was their constitution, you know? What were their Nuremberg laws and so on? We would have to apply inner criticism to them. The alternative would be either that we apply liberal standards to them or socialistic standards to them, which we don't want other people to do to us, or we would have to go back into metaphysics and say, did the fascist state really follow the platonic idea or was it following Hobbes? Because Hobbes invented the concentration camps and they had the concentration camps. So did the British in South Africa before and so on. So that is my joke all the time with Kitchener there. <laughs> I, was, I taught in Kitchener up there, you know, every summer. And uh, by 1914, <laughs> they changed Kitchener from Berlin. It was called Berlin. And so I always said, why the hell did you change that name, you know? Because General Kitchener was the inventor of concentration camps in South Africa, uh, who put, where they put the Boer in the Dutch. Tom Lawson, you know, was put in there. <laughs> so, so, therefore, you know, I said, you just, uh, you know, you, you could have called it Berlin, you know, or if you call it Berlin or Kitchener, you know, it's the same thing, you know, they, they, they both have concentration camps, Berlin and, and Kitchener, so, but, uh, uh, so, but, you know, can we do that? Can we go to Plato and Aristotle? Can we, I mean, by what means, you know, I mean, also subjectively, what would it mean to think like Plato? You would have to change your whole consciousness you have an immediate type of a consciousness where you see nature as immediate and not mediated by any idea, by any God or whatever. Not in Jewish terms, not in Christian terms, and so on. That is with this whole sociology of religion, you know. The sociology of religion is done by people who have an immediate consciousness according to which they can see nature only immediate and not mediated as it is the case for an Islamic person, as a case for a Christian and for a Jew, just call these three of them, you know, but there are more of them. Um, but if you then, with this immediate consciousness, study religion, you have to leave out something from the very beginning, in a priori, namely that what all these religious people are concerned with. And that is this universal, this absolute universal, which they call Allah, or which they call Yahweh, or whatever. So when this is nullified, you don't even know what these damned temples and all that is all about. And so, see, what you do now is you have to take certain aspects of these religions and make a definition out of it. And you have thousands of definitions. And every definition is the opposite of the other. Why? Because you only have these particular aspects of the religion, but you don't have the universal, the totality of religion, what it is really all about. That is missing. The universal is but missing. Because with your consciousness, you cannot think the universal. You can only think particulars, and you can see them with your eyes. And then with analytical understanding, you can differentiate them. We never get to what you call essentialism. You never get to the totality of the thing, to the universal, which they all have in common, by which you could judge them. You cannot judge them, because you don't have that. As a matter of fact, <coughs> you study a soul a study of bodies without a soul. It is a soulless type of a study of religion. That what moves all these people is exactly not what is the case. What is the case is that there are one billion Catholics and four, 40 million Methodists or whatever, you know, and they go to church every Sunday and sit on a chair or kneel or whatever. You can study all that. There are innumerable aspects, and according to these innumerable aspects, you can have innumerable definitions. In 50 years, this department asks, give me a definition of religion. 
and nothing comes from it except another one <laughs> another one of hundreds of them you know and these hundreds of definitions you know because the aspect which people see depends on their own consciousness so when it's a woman she sees that aspect somebody's a fascist he sees another aspect somebody's a socialist he sees another aspect you have perspectivism so this perspectivism means that you see certain particular aspects and through these particular aspects you make certain definitions and there's no end to them because there's no end to do the aspects of religion because if you move on the level of analytic understanding you analyze that means you differentiate and you can infinitely differentiate that means in terms of a bad infinity there's no end to it because if you stress liturgy well, you forget the hierarchy. If you stress the hierarchy, you forget the bureaucracy. <laughs> I mean, you know, so you can say religion is this, 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 this. And every time you come up with a singular, you know, that means a person, group of persons, and with a particular, a particular aspect or so. And what is missing is the soul which holds all that together. That means a movement of 6,000 years, 12,000 years, whatever it is, where people were always and always again religious. In the most greatest variety of, uh, of aspects, you know, some have a clergy, some don't have a clergy, you know. Some have dogmas, some don't have dogmas, you know. And so, therefore, everything particular which you define doesn't fit anything else. <laughs> and there you have all these books which they write and every book is different and then they throw the book out again next year because they are not happy with it because they have discovered another aspect of religion and so they, you know, the poor guy what is it there who wrote this textbook there in our department you know, and suddenly they don't use it anymore and then they use another one next year they say tired of it again Be because there is no end to this, right? But what we have to see dialectically is, you know, there is not only the religion and the aspects but there is also the level on which you, what your consciousness is like. And if you have an immediate consciousness, as all the positivists have, you can only see things in their immediacy and not as in their being mediated, because that cannot be made certain. If you have a Skinner box, you have all immediate things. You have a mouse, you have an electrode, you have food. And even there you have to be careful because you don't really know when that little mouse, you know, finally decides for food and not for the electrode because it hurts uh, what is going on in the little thing. And that's what's going on in the little thing. That Skinner calls the black box. And so does Pablo. So it's black box. That means they don't know. See, they know when it goes in, the stimulus. They know when it comes out in terms of a reaction out of the organism but they don't know what is happening in there so Freud still had the outside you know, and the inside they cut the inside and finally were agnostic about it because of the sea and that goes on since the, since the scientific revolution you know, where in the 17th century because the, when they ruled out the teleology you know because they see that the bird lifts some straw up there and make a nest and so on, but they cannot see into a little head which is programmed because this thing is not visible. See, what I can really see with my eyes and touch is it lifted up. So they kept, kept the cause of efficiency of the Aristotle, but they threw out the other one. And on what criteria? Of an immediate consciousness which only takes serious what is immediate and not what is mediated, like teleology is. That's it. So I, all what we ask now in all these questions is that the scientist not only sees the object in its aspects, but that he sees himself as well. What the hell am I doing, you know? When I'm a positivist, what is that, the positivist? What kind of a consciousness is that with which I filter things, you know? So that filter has to be come aware. And, and I mean, there are different sociological schools. And they look at society also in different aspects. One looks at the self individual side, you know, phenomenologists and so on. 
Others look at the system as a whole, like Parsons and Merton and Newman and so on. So, uh, but these are also it's the same thing, like with the study of religion. The whole science is in that crisis, you know. That is what Husserl tried to overcome, but he did the same thing. Finally, it wasn't overcome. So the science is in a crisis, you know. I read all these exams, civil sociology and so on, and there is Marx, <coughs> and there is Weber, and there is this uh, Durkheim, you know. And Durkheim and Weber and Marx and so on. The three don't even fit together. Marx is on the far left, you know, and hated Kant and all his children, you know. The other ones made their whole existence in order to fight Marx and so on. But then the two things are harmonized, you know. And Tom is done to both of them. So, I mean, that is the sociology of sociology, you know. That means where does the sociologist come from? What kind of, uh, our, our students come from the fourth estate, you know. Now they move into the, the third estate and they get all these bourgeois thinkings. They become little bourgeois now. And that's what they want to. They will have a better job. They will have a good income. They will become teachers for fellows and so on. Then suddenly they have to have a labor union. And they find out that they are labor. And that's a great disappointment, you know. But, so, I mean, just sociology of sociology is, is an important thing that one is aware, you know, from which group I come from, you know, you're Catholic, you know, you cannot say that your consciousness hasn't been shaped, you know, so it is shaped, so, and, and there's nothing wrong with it, except that you must be aware that it is shaped, and that a Protestant consciousness will be different, that you respect that, and that's where we come again to inner criticism, not to judge a Protestant I can say about the Catholic or by Catholic standards and say you are heretic. That's what we have in Iran, you know, where, where one cook said you are following this Mahdi there, you are heretic, you know. And we don't like you because when you are this Mahdi guy, you, we don't care about Mahdi, but you will not have enough respect for us. We are not necessary for you anymore, we, we imams and so on, because you have a direct con contact with Mahdi. You can take the phone and talk with Mahdi and <laughs> then you have uh, the truth, you know. Okay, do you know what, it's a very relative point of view which we have, but we see, you know, the sciences and we are in flux, you know. The sciences are serious about rejecting metaphysics, so we cannot go on as if they didn't exist or whatever, if they had not done that, as if they had not made this decision. They have made the decision, and they probably had good reasons for this decision. That means... There were probably deficiencies in the metaphysical position which made the step necessary into science. As there was in religion, some, there were deficiencies, you know, in this mythology, so that Homer tainted it into an uh, 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 ethos, you know, into, uh, into, uh, into poetry. He transformed <coughs> the myth into poetry and thereby tainted it, you know. And then came the philosophers, you know, and they did even another step to tame that mythology, you know, which was wild in a certain sense, you know. So I think that all these steps for a dialectician, they are not arbitrary. There was something in the mythos which made it necessary to make it into an epos. Mythos, epos. And to go from the epos to the logos, that means to the philosophers. And then to the positivists. So Kant's idea that the whole development, you know, comes from religion through philosophy to science can very well be accepted if we at the same time dialecticize it and say that it was not an arbitrary thing or whatever, that the last stage was overthrown, but that the stage itself had a deficiency in itself, something negative, which pushed it beyond itself. And adding to it that this new form contains still elements of the old one and preserves it, but adds a new element to it, and that therefore the negative is really the, the force which pushes things forward. And not that somebody just has a bad mood or, you know, criticized because he's angry or whatever, so, but that there is some objective movement, process, process is a good word, there is a process going on which is relatively independent from what our wishes are. We wished, you know, religion would never have been lost and we would never have gone to philosophy. It brought so much pain, you know. We 
wished philosophy had not been left behind. It was only 200 years ago by science, you know. A lot of science. There's the mass murderer guy there, the, the, you know, who invented the atomic bomb, the quantum physics, Einstein and so on. And when I go to the haircut people there, uh, has hanging there, Einstein and said, why do you have this mass murderer hanging over there? They don't even know that they have a mass murderer hanging there. But this whole thing with Iran, atomic bomb and, and, and so on, and proliferation and so on, he is responsible, you know. That means he developed the science. And not only that, he gave the science and its weaponization to all of us in a letter, which we have. He delivered the bomb. He produced the whole problem, you know. It's a beauty of science. It's a beautiful scientist, you know. The, uh, the, the, uh, Ivan Supek, you know, was a quantum physicist and was supposed to build the bomb for, for Yugoslavia, refused to do that. And not only that, he stopped to study quantum physics. And he was good at it. I wrote an honor, what was it, uh, what do they do, this honor thing book there, and I wrote an article for him. You know, he was a humanist and a scientist, and it's humanism, and I don't go on with the science anymore. I don't study it anymore, I don't write about it anymore, and I don't teach it anymore. Because it has led to that, with necessity, you know. The scientists are very naive, they played around with it and had fun with it, you know. But then suddenly the, the government takes them up, we need this, you know, and so on. And you have this Manhattan Project here. And even those scientists in the Manhattan Project, they, they, it is unbelievable, their naivete, they thought it would not be used. It would not be used. They thought they would maybe threaten with it. They wrote a card to Roosevelt, throw it on an island where nobody lives, and send a postcard to the emperor. Um, and, and then this God-forsaken priest, you know, who blesses the atomic bomb, who was put on Hiroshima. And not like Walter said, he, he blessed the, the woo, he blessed the bomb, the little fat man. He placed the bomb, put the holy water on it. And not only that, a few days later, he placed the bomb for, for Nagasaki. Twice, twice he did it. So there you see religion and so on, you know. This is all insane, you know. I mean, that's sick. That is pathology. That is pathological, you know. If you want to see the pathology of Catholicism, take that guy, by the way, he converted. <coughs> he didn't die as such, you know. He said the army had conditioned him uh, in a certain way that he couldn't see things. And then he became a peace agent, you know, of, uh, <coughs> and uh, and died as such. So he was all kind of moving in all kinds of associations to prevent that forever. So the priests, you know, repented deeply what he did. But that he did it and the superiors, you know, and all let him do that and so on shows a real pathological moment, you know. And we had Father John was here, you know, and I have him in my book. And Father John, uh, um, you know, went to Vietnam and he was a morale officer. There are all these innumerable war crimes and he consoled them all and blessed them all and so on. Then he came home and then he went to that peace thing, this peace pole which you have out there, comes from Father John. He's now dying from Alzheimer's, you know. He cannot even recognize me anymore, so it's very, very sad. But Father John read my book once and saw himself in there. I said, Father John's a very loving person, but he was in Vietnam. He was an officer, and then he converted, and, and so on. So. And he was very upset. So he was in church, and he stood there with my book and said, Only the truth! Only the truth! And I said, John... I said, don't get a heart attack now. Let's go to, it was, we went to that restaurant over there, <laughs> Bill Naps, and uh, there, let's have lunch and then uh, we can talk about it. And if I didn't say the truth at any point, the next edition, we will change it. So then we talked, and nothing about the book. He just told me why he became a soldier. He had trouble with bishops, every bishop he had trouble. And in order to get rid of them, he volunteered for the army. But he had to volunteer for Vietnam. He did not, was not forced to go to Vietnam. He voluntarily went to Vietnam. So then I said, well, nothing about the book. I didn't change anything about the book. Because he did not make any argument. He just explained to me how it all came about. So 
I mean, I tell you all this about, you know, in terms of diagnosis and pathology and therapy and how careful one has to be now in the present scientific situation. We cannot simply think like Plato any longer. We can think greatly of Aristotle. He determined thousands of years. But we cannot come and say, let's start with the idea and let's measure uh, even the absolute idea of God and let's measure North Korea if their state is healthy or not let's measure us if we are state healthy or not there's no possibility nobody would understand you you have to write volumes in order to say what you're doing you know that means the whole thing has completely shifted to the subjective side and you can see you know the idea was in heaven I saw the idea is in things you know nominalists the idea is in us, just in our head, and we put it on it, and positivism is a form of nominalism. <coughs> That's it. And you have all these scholars and so on, and you cannot simply talk as if you were Plato. They put you in an insane asylum. You cannot simply talk, and, and so the question specifically why the Catholic social and circuit letters don't work anybody, where they are Aristotelian. Nobody in this country understands, except if it's a Jesuit and sits in a monastery or, or sits in his study and studies it, you know. But no normal American, normal, yeah, it is normal, normal American can understand that thing, what he says, because he takes notions to be real. He takes universals, justice, love, to be real. That's not nominalism. That's called realism, you know, or idealism. So, and we have rejected that. we do got 20 minutes. Okay, you yeah, so... Okay, so there is a last thing which I want to, I don't have to go into this, but there's a little thing here which is called amnesty. Uh, states uh, use uh, uh, ex execution as power means that there's statistic how many are, you know, how many are killing people. And um, not for justice sake, um, in China uh, executions are secret to a large extent thousands probably executed. Iran, officially Tehran, 314 executions in Tehran, which we just discussed. Um, the uh, number may be double, but they don't know. It is amnesty, the international amnesty, international. Um, Iraq, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, it's our executions, 211 to 212 we have gone up. Uh, at least 129 human beings have been executed in Iraq. Um, Saudi Arabia sentenced uh, publicly. They are killing by the thought. They cut the head off. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 2012, uh, a lot of uh, executions because of drugs, ad adultery, drugs, adultery, and witchcraft. We have to be careful that Katya will not yeah, okay. That would be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. And the United States, only democracy, uh, we are at the peak of the countries which do still execution. We had 43 executions, uh, three, uh, three quarters, uh, they were all this, they were, or three quarters of them were executed in only four states. We have several states now which uh, have rejected uh, the, the thing. That Texas had 15 executions, which is much lower than under under Bush. Bush had 51 once. Yeah. Oklahoma had six. Arizona had six. Mississippi had six. They were all poisoned, not by the thought. And so we know the whole story. Sometimes you know, in order to look at the therapy and and. Uh, pathology is to look in the um, past there uh, um, uh, before the Second World War there was only one country which did not execute and that was Norway after the war nobody in the West executed anybody because Hitler had abused this so much you know not only in order to justice or whatever but in order to gain power his opponents and so on that all were ashamed to do it. Oh, and then came the 60s and 70s, when, when societies get unstable, they need deterrence. And so we, in, uh, the Supreme Court decided the states could decide, and about 25 states, I think. This is, uh, our state didn't, but uh, 25 states, I think, decided to have the death penalty. By the way, 
the number of states which have death penalty went down, but the executions went up. That means there are fewer states which kill more people. That's statistics for you. <laughs> okay, so that is all for us. I think we had we came once more to the core of our discussion here, right? And the problematic of it. I want you to be aware how problematic all that is, right? And how we do it now. But the way we do it now may be so deficient that a few years from now they will not do it anymore as we do it now. That depends on us to point out the deficiencies because that is the motor, right, which moves things. <coughs> okay, so which movie would you like to have? Should we go on with that Hitler thing? There you have a real pathological case. By the way, I mean, your last thing was we also have to use inner criticism for fascism, right? <coughs> so we have to measure also the fascists, not by liberal or whatever standards, social standards, but by, by their own standards. So as we put down in Hitler's My Struggle, in his second book, in his table talks, and so on, it becomes very clear what their idea of a good man was, what their idea of a good nation was, state, and so on. And we have to see, you know, to what extent they contradicted their own ideals. Mm -hmm. If you want to say that they were objectively and in itself wrong, you have to become a Platonist. Or an Aristotelian. Or a Hegelian. By positive scientific standards, you could not say that they were. And this is true for Milosevic, too. He went to the uh, court, you know, in uh, Den Haag. And he was there for three years until he got a heart attack, and he was not sentenced. Because he simply argued according to the constitution of Yugoslavia. And according to the constitution, he had to keep the six republics together. And when it didn't go peacefully, he had to use force, and he used force. Every American president would do that if Texas wants, wants to leave the Union, they will bomb it in the Stone Age. They have done that with Detroit. You know, when they were rebellions, even with just rebellions in Detroit in the 40s. You know, uh, they did it with Los Angeles. You know, they did it with Miami, and so on. So that is that would not be pathological, strangely enough, because that a state which is in the crisis, that measures are taken to hold it together, is healthy. If you don't like it, you have to take the alternative. We have to go back into metaphysics in order to know what pathological is. But we cannot, we, we wouldn't get a consensus now. We may be right, but we wouldn't get a consensus. Okay, so should we take our uh, Hitler thing there? Okay. Let's put it in there. I, I think it is, it's good to, uh, you have the right thing? Uh, because, um, and, and uh, think of it when you see it now, you know, what would be pathological by Hitler's own standards? Uh, he, he executes Fagelein, who was the brother-in-law of his wife. Must that not be seen as being pathological, you know? When he got this uh, thing there and said, I cannot lead anymore, and practically retired before his generals and say, do, do what you, uh, you want to, I commit suicide now, you know. Was that really, uh, was that pathological? He was a Schopenhauerian. According to Schopenhauer, you were not allowed to do suicide. It would be sick to do suicide and it was senseless. But Schopenhauer had one exception. Two lovers can commit suicide. He committed suicide together with his lover, with his wife. So, so this apply what we discussed now to this, you know, to the That is Goebbels. Yeah, we saw that. Yeah, I think that's the right point there. Okay. And we were just after this, but. Yeah.
See, he did it. He, he lost it. See, so he became sick. But he will get healthy again.
was considered by the Nazis themselves to be pathological. All that killing. and the shoot stuff. Rudy, were these all over Berlin? Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. It said Rausch and Verboden. Mm. No smoking. <laughs>
Thank you. 